Elaine, can you hear me? In your earbuds, can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, You should have been able to hear me. Excuse me, just a minute. Yeah. So this should be on. And your video is turned off. I turned it off. Okay. <laughs> You have all 15 of the people that want to speak. Okay, good evening, everyone. It's uh, 6.30, and we will now commence our uh, committee meetings. The first committee that we'll meet this evening is the Curriculum and Extracurricular Committee. And uh, we have uh, 15 people who wished to speak to the board this evening. Um, we have a board procedure, a policy, number 903 that talks to um, the public addressing the board. And that the essence of that instruction say that the period of time for each speaker is limited to five minutes and a total time of 30 minutes. So clearly with 15 speakers, they're not gonna be able to speak for five minutes and be under the 30 minutes. And if they all spoke for five minutes, that would be 75 minutes and that's excessive. So I propose to the board that we limit each of the speakers to about uh, two and a half minutes. And that comes to about uh, 37, 38 minutes total uh, time. And uh, by the time you switch between one speaker and the next, that'll take some time. So it'll probably be about 45 minutes. Does anyone on the board object to that? Okay, I don't hear anybody objecting. So we will proceed with uh, public comment. The first person on the list is uh, Mr. Josh Martin. So Mr. Martin, the floor is yours. Good evening. Uh, can you hear me well? I can. Okay, thank you. My name is Josh Martin, and I'm a 1991 graduate of Biglerville High School, where I played four varsity sports. I also coached on the elementary, middle school, and high school levels at Biglerville, and I am the co-president of the Biglerville Athletic Booster Association. My daughter Morgan is a senior who is a three-sport athlete, and I've covered high school sports for the Gettysburg Times for more than 20 years. I've experienced the immeasurable benefits of athletics from every conceivable angle, which added to my frustration as I watched Adams County Schools move forward while Upper Adams sat back and waited. Of the 570 PIAA schools that have football, which is considered to be the riskiest of all fall sports, approximately 85% are playing. Of the 92 District 3 schools that have football, only three have opted out of the season. And of the 23 schools that comprise the YAIAA, including our six Adams County neighbors, only Biglerville remains undecided. Our athletes are clearly the last in limbo. Two weeks ago, you said you wanted to hear the PIAA's decision and gather more information. The PIAA voted to proceed under a plan approved by its Sports Medicine Advisory Committee. 
And I trust during your information gathering, you thoroughly reviewed that plan, which includes safety guidelines for each fall sport. I trust you reached out to Biglerville coaches to ask how they are safely conducting voluntary off-season workouts and plan to proceed with fall competition. And I trust that you contacted Adams County Schools to learn how they're safely moving forward with sports and mitigating liability concerns. As we have seen at Bermudian Springs, Tolone Catholic, Fairfield, Gettysburg, Littlestown, and New Oxford, boards have made public their belief in their coaches and their athletes. Our athletes are still waiting to have that belief placed in them. Alumni, parents, and community members believe in them. Their coaches believe in them. And now it's your turn. Listen to the emotion in their voices and understand how agonizing this wait has been as they desperately hope to play and represent their school. Their words are far more important than any I speak because this is their time, not mine and not yours. It is theirs. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Mr. Martin. The next uh, person on the list is uh, Miss Morgan Martin. Can you hear me? I can, yes. Okay. Um, good evening, board members. As most of you know, my name is Morgan Martin. I'm a senior athlete. I'm in favor of allowing students to participate in sports here at BHS. This is ultimately a choice that should be led up to the athletes and the parents of those athletes. I've chosen to play field hockey, basketball, and track and field all years of high school and have lettered every season of every sport. As well as being a three-sport athlete, I'm a member of National Honor Society, National Art Honor Society, Minithon Committee, Solutionaries Club, the 2020 Prom Committee, Yearbook Committee, and also a science tutor, all while maintaining a 4.0 GPA. On top of that, throughout high school, I've attended nearly all sporting events for every sport that we offer, partly due to the fact of my parents being the co-presidents of BABA, and also because I love to support my friends who play, and I just simply enjoy watching sports. This is what has made high school so enjoyable for me and other athletes, and it is another factor that pushes us to do well in school. Now, while at first I was frustrated, that I would only be attending school in person two days a week my senior year, I've come to understand the reasons behind this choice. But I cannot understand how the uncertainty of high school sports is even in question tonight. I cannot understand how other schools, every other school in our county are able to play. And we have to stand here tonight and fight for that ability. I cannot understand how simple questions proposed last board meeting that were clearly stated in the PIAA return to competition plan, as well as BHS's adapted return guidelines, which everyone had access to prior to the meeting. How are we expected to put our trust into you when you weren't even fully educated on what you were deciding upon? BHS and student athletes need more advocacy from the board and the athletic director during these uncertain times. Please know that student athletes, coaches, and parents are willing to do absolutely whatever it takes to play, whether that be under the school's guidelines or not. These outlets will include clubs, AU organizations, or just simply pick up in public areas, but that's not what we want. We want to play with our friends, for our community, wearing black and gold and representing our school. The choice that you make tonight, whichever way it goes, is going to change the lives of student athletes. I plead with you to not take this decision lightly because I need to play, we need to play, please let us play. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Martin. Our next speaker is Mrs. Kate Tucky. Good evening, can you hear me? I can, yes. Thank you again for listening to all of our speakers. Um, I commend the student athletes for stepping up to the mic as well. Thank you so much. Community, August 27th, 2011, the Saturday before my five-year-old would start kindergarten. She had already met her teacher and some of her classmates, but in an instant, everything stopped, much like it did here on March 13th, 2020. I want to draw some parallels and paint a picture that is based on actual circumstances that I have witnessed time and time again. In 2011, it wasn't COVID-19. It was acute lymphoblastic leukemia, and it didn't just affect my five-year-old. This entire community rallied for our family and held us up while we were crumbling to the ground in pieces. My daughter was resilient, but she also didn't know exactly what all she was missing yet. Her brothers were just starting tackle football. While I was in Hershey with Becca learning about platelets and red blood cells, family and friends helped shuttle the boys to the practice fields. On a Saturday morning, they had team pictures. Another mom pulled their duct tape off their helmets for them and sent them on their way. Community, it's what I fell in love with 19 years ago. I will always treasure the kindness and love our family has been showered with. And this is a representation of all of the community signatures we have gathered for this cause. 
When Becca relapsed in 2014, it nearly broke her. I have told you many thoughts as they relate to the decision at hand in a previous letter, but I need you all to hear this as in person, face to face as we can get right now. I almost lost a piece of my heart that day. She was in third grade and she was healthy. We were blindsided. This time she knew exactly what she would be losing. Her brothers were scared and I was terrified and numb. And just like on March 13th of this year, everything was ripped away. We had to piece her back together and to this day, we still are. We as adults use the phrase, at least we are in the same boat together, probably more than we should because we aren't all in the same boat. Many of you have children or grandchildren actively participating in clubs or travel teams. But what about the low income family whose child has been a caregiver or simply at home while his parents head to work? I fought so hard for my daughter so she didn't slip through the, the cracks. Now I'm fighting for our student athletes. This amazing community has again rallied for each other's kids and are giving a voice to them and they will never stop. Personal responsibility and choices. When Becca asked if she could wrestle that very same year, just months after her initial diagnosis, she had two pretty amazing big brothers and she really wanted to do everything they could. I talked to her oncologist and we agreed to let her wrestle. As a parent, I knew she needed the outlet. It was a very deliberate choice. This we bought her a protector. We need to wrap this up here. You've exceeded your time. almost finished to protect her central line port. We made sure she had enough neutrophils to fight infection and we let her wrestle. And oh, did she get after it. It gave her purpose and sense of belonging to something, of accomplishing something. Even at the age of five, she knew she needed to be a part of something. She will have a choice of which one in regards to face coverings, but she already knows what her responsibility will be during that time. I will skip to my last paragraph. You cannot say to these student athletes, there's always next season because there isn't always next season. Beck and I have cried together at far too many funerals of children who have lost their battle with childhood cancer. And I will fight with every ounce of energy I can to give her and other student athletes opportunities to engage in their passions because tomorrow is not promised to anyone. And while we didn't know enough about COVID in the spring of this year, we do now. We know what to do in this community to keep our neighbors safe and our students do as well. Let them show you what they can do. Let them rise to the occasion. Let them shine. Let them be a part of something they love. UASD, let them play. Thank you. Thank you. And I will remind everyone because of time constraints, you have two and a half minutes. And the last speaker was close to double that. So please keep that in mind. Our next speaker is uh, Miss Rebecca Tucky. And Rebecca, you're muted right now. Can you hear me? Now I can, yes. Thank you for allowing me to speak tonight. My name is Rebecca Tucky. And as you can see, sports have been a huge part of my family and I's lives. I was diagnosed with childhood cancer in 2011 and a year later I was relapsed. The ground that I'd walked on for five years was ripped out from under me. And then a year later, the same thing was ripped out from under me again. I had to watch it all go by. I had no willpower to get up to live the next day. And that was terrifying. Sports gave me that outlet to do everything. And the same thing I guarantee you will happen to these athletes if you take fall sports away. So please take into consideration all of the lives that will be changed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tucky. Uh, the next speaker is uh, Caitlin Wilson. Hi, dear, dear members of the board, I first started playing sports in middle school for a club team. I remember not wanting to go to my games or even be a part of a team. I was always sticking to myself rather than expanding my game, my comfort level to make friends. After that season, I decided to play for the school team. Then my friend convinced me to go try out for the girls basketball team. Thankfully, my coaches saw the raw talent in me and decided to invest their time. Ever since our first practice, I've spent the majority of my time training with personal trainers and the school. From there forward, I slowly made it up to the high school teams. Every single day and every single practice, my teammates pushed me the best person and player I could be. They opened my person personality up to be a more vocal, positive, and outgoing teammate. At every practice, I looked up to the seniors as a role model. I always loved helping people and encouraging them. 
but mostly I love the feeling of others trusting you with everything they have. Now this year as a senior, it's my chance to fill in that spot and give the younger girls encouragement and positivity that the seniors gave me last year. I've always wanted to be a role model for my sister who I've played with since I first started. We weren't the closest of sisters, but since we started playing sports, it has taught us to put aside our differences and just play. This is because when she or I step off the field, we both know exactly how the other's feeling. Last year was the first year we played together in five years. It's a different feeling when you have a sibling out on the field playing by your side. It means the world to both of you. This is my last year playing with my sister for Big Laville, in this uniform, for these fans, and for this community. So many people don't understand what it means when you have crowds gathering just to watch you play. Playing the game helps some athletes cope with stress, get their minds off of school, or even personal problems. I know a lot of kids that use sports as their getaway place. I, like many, would like to continue playing at the college level. Last year was a very important year to have colleges looking at you and hopefully recruiting. However, this year is even more significant. This is the year that seniors need to give everything they have in games to show colleges that they can play for their school. It's the year we should be happy and excited and finding a college to play for. Instead, we're filled with more stress than most of us can handle. Please find it in your hearts to allow us to continue our senior year sports. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Benjamin Wicker. Mr. Wicker, are you there? All right, I don't see him. So, Mr. Wicker, yeah. you're up. Can you hear me? I can. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, all right. My name is Ben Wicker, and I'm a senior at Biggerville High School. I play football and basketball. I'm here to speak in support of keeping fall sports available. Football to me is not just a sport. Football is an escape. I suffer from mental health issues, and two years ago, my mental health was so bad that I decided not to play football at all. That year, instead of going to football practice, I went home, and I had nothing to do. I didn't do my homework. I had no football practice. There was nothing I could do. Instead of having pride in my grades or my academic performances, I would normally go to football practice and take out all my stress on the football field. That year, I couldn't. Much like that year, this year is the same. If we don't have fall sports, if we don't have fall sports, then there's no way for me to cope with my stress, and there's no way with me, for me to cope with my mental health issues. It's imperative that we have a football season so that I can do these things. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is uh, Mrs. Katie Weigel, or Miss Katie Weigel, I'm not sure. Hi, um, I am speaking to you tonight as a mom of two student athletes, the wife of a coach, and also a former athlete through high school and on college. But I would like to focus specifically on a number provided in the initial email response to me and others two weeks ago when the proposal of canceling fall sports and extracurriculars was put on the table. And that number was 30%. According to your data, you believe this decision would only affect 30% of the students in middle and high school. Respectfully, I believe you are wrong. <clears throat> this decision affects 100% of the students. You see, one of my student athletes actually doesn't play a fall sport, yet this affects him. And that is because there is value in the collective team no matter what the season. Because of the presence of sports in a, in a school directly affects student morale. It's a unifying factor in our student body. When my family considered moving to this area only a few years ago, we visited on a Friday night and we came to a football game. And do you know what gave me the extra reassurance that our children would thrive here? It was watching students from diverse backgrounds, differing interests and social statuses unite to support their football team and see their band. And upon moving here, that has only proven true time and time again. I've watched students move from one game to the next because of what the score was, who the opponent was, or what monumental accomplishment was about to happen. And since March, our students have not had that opportunity. Quite frankly, if there is ever a need to encourage a sense of unity in all circumstances and the value of that collective team among our young people, it's now. You may look at the numbers and consider that only 30% of the students are involved in a particular fall sport or activity, but really 100% of the students are invested in their own student body. This, this is important to 100% of the students in the upper Adams Middle and high, school, high schools. 
I'd also like to take a moment and focus on one other comment that was made in your last meeting. It was said, if somebody is going to be miserable, everybody is going to be miserable. To which I would like to say, why do we have to make somebody miserable? Why, do we, why can't we think that this can be done safely? Why do they have to be miserable when these athletes and many more in the entire region have been playing baseball, basketball, soccer, softball, wrestling, field hockey, and simply spending time together throughout the summer safely? Our athletes have been safely coming to open gym workouts following the guidelines that you approved. There's it's, been no outbreak and there are no overrun hospitals. It's time to wrap it up. Mrs. Okay, that's fine. I'm almost done. This is the time to focus on uplifting our students and not stand in their way and allow them to be miserable. Instead of considering a glass half empty approach, why can't we fill that glass? Why can't we instead decide that the best can happen for our entire student body? Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is Kaylin Shira. Can you hear me? I can. Good evening, Upper Adams School District Board. My name is Kalen Sher and I'm a senior athlete here at Biglerville. I have played football all four years of high school and I've run and thrown in track and field. I am sure you know why I'm speaking tonight along with my classmates and teammates. We as a school and community want to have sports this fall, winter and spring. The closing of sports will affect more than just us fall athletes in our school. It will affect our winter and spring sports as well. Why would anyone want to see a group of high school kids have all their effort and dedication ripped away from them? It is their last shot at having a high school glory moment. Biglerville is home to some amazing teams and athletes. Last year, the girls' soccer team had one of the best seasons they ever had. In the winter during wrestling, Levi Haynes ranked second in the state as one of the best wrestlers in the entire state. I had my junior year of track season taken from me, which is gonna be a big year for me. In practice, my numbers were getting close to beating the record. And that's what I was going for all year. And I had that taken from me and I don't want any of the other kids to have that taken from them. At the end of the day, it is not just about the athletes and the kids. It's about the families and the fans and the community, the parents, the siblings, aunts, uncles, grandparents, cousins, and family friends that all love to watch us play. The loss of sports at Baylorville will impact all of us, those people too. The people who want to watch their kids or friends play the sport they love. Another thing that I'd like to point out is all the other schools in our county are allowing sports with certain conditions. Why can't we? The PIAA released a return to play plan and had specific guidelines so the teams can play. Why can't we? Let us play. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our next speaker is uh, Rachel Mead. Hi there. Good evening. My name is Rachel Mead and I'm a parent and registered nurse here in Adams County. I've seen firsthand the effects of COVID-19. It's just not the patients who have the virus, but the impact felt in the area, especially in the medical community. One thing we always talk about with patients is the benefits outweighing the risks. Surgeons discuss this with the patients before invasive surgery. Oncologists discuss this with their cancer patients with treatments. And when administering chemotherapy to patients, I remind myself, even though these chemicals I'm fusing into their body will hold many risks, make them sick, inflict chaos in their life while under treatment, it also allows them a future with the possibility of a longer life, more time with family and friends. Again, the benefits outweigh the risks. When I view what COVID-19 has brought to our community and especially our children in school, it's frightening. Yes, the mandated quarantine allowed hospitals time to prepare and be ready with PPE, but the fact is we have not had the inundation of COVID-19 patients as expected, which I'm thankful for. As of August 31st, there have been 134,000 positive cases and 1.5 million negative results. Getting more specific of deaths, of the 7,000 deaths in Pennsylvania, 5,100 deaths are from nursing homes where patients have pulse, which address their end-of-life wishes. Many did not want excessive measures to prolong their life if they fell ill. What we have seen is a major increase in patients too scared to leave their home to seek treatment for current conditions, such as heart disease, COPD, diabetes, mental health assistance, and cancer. 
that resulted in those comorbidities to take over their bodies until more damage was done. That is the frustrating aspect of working in the medical field, the fear this caused to the point of detriment to our community health. But the sector of population I'm most concerned about is the students in our community. Watching the emergency department and waiting for admissions to our floor, I've seen firsthand the increase in children coming in for overdoses, suicidal thoughts or threats, mental instability, and kids looking for help. It is heartbreaking to note the impact on this population. The age group that is most likely to be impacted is over 65 years of age with 90 times higher mortality rate. The under age 18 group is nine times less likely to be admitted to the hospital for COVID and 12 times less likely to die. There have only been 94 deaths for the 18 and under age bracket due to COVID in the country. Yes, unfortunate and tragic, but considering the U.S. population is 74.2 million, the risk of death is minimal. In comparison, over 2,800 children between 15 and 20 were killed in motor vehicle accidents, and over 300,000 were treated in the emergency room for injuries associated with accidents. This the numbers me. are staggering your, compared your to the risk is, of COVID, yet me. we entrust our children behind the wheel and trust they will not harm themselves or anyone else in the road. Again, this the benefits outweigh the risks, and we us. don't think twice. Because I will wrap it up. This That'd be great. We need to protect the mental health and physical aspects as a community and give them opportunities to do as such a realistic to their actual risk. I signed a four page agreement with my son's lacrosse club outlining every risk this summer season allow them to play. I fully took into consideration every aspect as I do work in the medical field and the benefits outweighing the risks were tenfold. We traveled four states over the months of July, including hotspot cities as Philly, Baltimore, Virginia, and Delaware. His team played other teams from 25 states across the country, including Canada. We we're to be notified if anyone tested positive, not one player or spectator tested positive. All sports are voluntary and we, are, we as parents understand the benefits outweigh the risks in allowing our children to take part. So for those of you who have children participating in sports currently with a school or outside the district, voting no to allow our students to play would make you very hypocritical in the community's eyes. My theory is that Hershey Park Casino- It's time theaters, to wrap this up, ma'am. Got it. I also understand my son's out, um, fortunate to play sports outside. Not everyone here can. I think all that's speaking tonight as well as the community behind the students understand the benefits outweigh the rest. So let our students play. Thank you, Mrs. Mead. Uh, our next speaker is Mr. Jacob Mead. Hi there. Good evening to all in the Upper Adams School District Board, School Board. Let me briefly introduce myself. I'm Jacob Mead, a junior here at Biggerville and a very invested student athlete competing within and outside of our high school sports. I take pride in representing my school and I'm cognizant of my actions and how it impacts our school. Within the school district, I'm involved in soccer, wrestling, track and field, student council, and an officer in our FFA. I'm here today to advocate for the many student athletes who will benefit from having a fall sports season. When we were first sent home from school in March, I was in the beginning of track season. And regardless whether students participated in the sport or not, the majority were excited to get a break from everything. Now, while this sounds great at first glance, the reality quickly set in with students being stuck at home, isolated, not being able to go anywhere or do anything with friends or family as a normal school break would go. Students had no way to get out of the house and would feel like they were trapped and lose motivation to do anything. Some became parents to their younger siblings while their parents worked and even being their teacher. That is the reality. Our generation needs social interaction and goal-driven activities, which include sports and other groups such as band, FFA, and TSA. Without these goal-driven activities, our mental health suffers and some students will find their outlet in activities that are not safe or legal. This is the reality you need to consider. I worry about my fellow students and the long-term effects of having opportunities ripped away from them while other school districts in our area allow their students to play. There will be a trickle-down effect of their well-being and productivity for our students in this district. But only you can hold that decision of the well-being in your hands with your vote tonight. Unlike some of my fellow students, I am fortunate enough to play a sport that our school does not offer, that being lacrosse. I, am I play for a nationally recognized team with members from four states. If you're not familiar familiar with lacrosse it is a physical can contact sport that may look like a combination between hockey, football, and soccer. It involves a physical body contact, constant conditioning, and physical exertion. And yes, a hel helmet sport with pads, and in my case, a six-foot carbon lacrosse stick. Over the summer, I was fortunate enough to be able to play in several tournaments and college showcases. 
Our parents made the decision to let us play for the team. They signed the agreements that allow us play with understanding the risks. But our parents saw the benefits of letting us play. Remember, I was in full contact, similar to our football players in an open field, like our soccer and field hockey athletes That's in the mean, open it's air. It's time to wrap One, this up. I'm, I'm finishing up soon. One college showcase had over 200 plus athletes playing on three fields with each athlete allowed one or two spectators to come and watch. The spectators were to wear a mask and lie the fence on the turf fields. So if you do the math, there were easily over 500 people. Plus, this was from 6 a.m. to from 11 a.m. to 6 p.m. And not one person tested positive. So here I leave you with the decision that will impact many students. Do you want your hands on the long-term impacts of stripping away our outlet to relieve stress, develop leadership skills, have tr trusting mentors, succeed academically, and work as one on a team? Yes, the decision is in the board's hands, but remember we volunteer to play. We have our parents' support to play, and only you can join the rest of the county and let us play. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mr. Mead. Our next speaker is Heidi Orner. She's, there she is. Heidi, I can't hear you. Are you muted? Are you able to hear me now? Now I can hear you now. Okay. Good evening. I'm Heidi Orner. I'm a sophomore at BHS and I'm a cheerleader on the fall cheer squad. I believe that for fall 2020, we should have all sports. One of the many reasons I think we should have sports is because the school year already isn't going to be the same even if we would have these sports. There would be no pep rallies before big games like homecoming. The football team would have to select a modified roster for away games. Athletes not in active play would be required to wear a mask, and we might not be allowed to have spectators at our games. While the students and athletes would adjust to these new requirements, the season wouldn't be anything like we've had before. If you could ask any athlete alumni from BHS what they would describe their high school life experience as, almost everyone would include their sport they were a part of. The majority of the school plays some form of sport or club, whether it is soccer, basketball, tennis, track, cheerleading, field hockey, baseball, band, or more. This only proves that 20 years from now, most memories for these high school students will include their sport or club. Sports can be one of the greatest outlets for students. They can come to a game or practice and only worry about having fun and working hard to achieve a new goal for the sport and leaving the real world behind for a part of time. With sports, some kids could fall into situations and lifestyles they do not want. To play a sport, you only have to have dedication, responsibility, accountability, and work ethic. You also need a stable academic standpoint. Some athletes work harder academically during their sports season to guarantee that their grades will not affect whether or not they play. I believe that this is a great reason to have fall sports, otherwise some kids would have no desire or reason to work hard in the classroom. Nearly every parent that I've spoken to about high school sports has said, enjoy your time while it lasts because it goes by in the blink of an eye. For some athletes, they won't pursue their sport later in life, whether it's college or a pro league. So these high school games are crucial and very meaningful to those individuals. Sports isn't just about making goals, scoring touchdowns, running the quickest time, or having the crowd cheer for you. Sports can completely mature an individual and teach them key life lessons and crucial skills for later in their life. This year is the year for these seniors. I've grown up watching some of these students playing their sport and even cheering them on on the sidelines. Senior year for these athletes is about being the leader and having their spotlight they've been waiting for for years. Just remember that the last time some of these athletes suited up and stepped on that field, they never imagined it'd be their last time. Without having these sports, these seniors may not remember their last game as a canner. Thank you for your time and I hope my thoughts have made you consider having fall sports. Thank you very much, Ms. Horner. Our next speaker is Ms. Uh, Lila Phoebus. Hi, my name is Lila Phoebus, and growing up as a teen in the United States, sports has greatly impacted my life. I can admit I myself am not the most athletic person. However, I have experienced the benefits of high school sports. It keeps me active, it teaches me how to respect others, it gives me individuality and the opportunity to be part of a team. Freshman and sophomore year, I participated in field hockey. Not only was I active, but I also felt like part of the community. Field hockey taught me how to respect others, work as a team, and grow as an independent team player. The bond between teammates is an irreplaceable experience that every child should experience at some point in their school career. Now, as a member of the Biglerville tennis team, I can proudly say that sports are essential for growth. 
Looking beyond the great physical benefits that come with tennis, the sport is also proven to improve mental health and higher self-esteem, as well as grow self-discipline and improve problem-solving skills. With sports, students are given the space to grow and connect that they may not get to experience anywhere else. So let us play. Let us play for our friendships. Let us play for our mental health. And most importantly, let us play for the community. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Phoebus. Uh, Mr. Jonathan Sanchez is the next speaker. Hello, can you hear me? I can, yes. Uh, good evening. Hello, uh, my name is Jonathan Sanchez. I'm a senior on the football team. I've played and dedicated a large portion of my life to the sport since middle school. This season is very important to me and my future. I have high hopes to be the first person in my family to go to college. I would also like to play football in college. I need a season in order to reach out to colleges and find where I'll be going for my next chapter in life. Not only do I need the season for college reasons, but I also use football as my way to build strong friendships that will give me memories to hold onto for a lifetime. Stepping on the fields with the boys that I practice with five days a week is a feeling I will never forget. The team dinners and competi competition Tuesdays are a few of my favorite things about the season. We laugh and make jokes and have a good time, but when we need to get down to work, we always do. We support each other on and off the field. The, bro the brotherhood and unity of the team creates a family mm -hmm. away from home. These boys are more than just teammates to me, they're brothers. Like many others, I don't have the privilege to play on a cl club team or go anywhere else to play if this all gets taken away. I finally reached my final high school season and I cannot be more excited about it. Please don't take it away from us now. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sanchez. Uh, our next speaker is uh, Kalani Crum. Ms. Crum. Hello. Hello, my name is Kalani Crum. I'm an, I'm an 11th grade student athlete that runs both cross country and track. We have been going through such a hard time as a community and sports are an amazing way to rise up and come together. So many students go through mental health issues, especially as of late due to the COVID outbreak. Sports offer an amazing outfit, outlet, not only, ment not only for mental health, but physical health can be ben benefited from sports. Throughout the quarantine, many people have struggled with staying active and sports are a great way to get us back into a healthier lifestyle. As a community and as students, we have so much to gain by allowing sports. Thank you for your time and consideration. And thank you, Mr. Crum. I'm sorry I called you miss. I misspoke, obviously. Uh, the last person that is on our list to speak tonight is Mr. Eric Melkor Cool. Hello. Hello, we can hear you. All right. Good evening. My name is Eric Melkor Cool, and I am a senior. With your decision tonight will impact my experience at Upper Adams and many memories with as many wait, as many memories as a student here. As you have heard tonight, many of us need sports in our school district to help us with more than just physical aspect of playing. Now all of us will be looking into the sport as we play. As a venue to play in college, some of us uh, will choose a trade school or technical job instead. This is our last year with our classmates and friends. We are not all in the same boat, but we all want to play. So please hear us out. For some, for some having a sports season keep, kept them motivated to do well in school without sports. They lose their drive to do well academically. Some sports took their coaches and mentors as advocators for their well-being. I can speak on behalf of the soccer team. We have supportive coaches and assistant coaches who help us grow and become more productive young men and keep us focused on our schoolwork and helping our community. We have adults we can trust and have something in common with them. That is hard to find and we need people to look up to and allow us to have an outlet to deal with our personal life in school. We need sports more than more just for playing on the field. It's for life lessons and growing up to be a productive and successful adult. Do not, do not, I do not want my fellow seniors to go through the heartbreak of all these working hard men playing sports and waiting for the senior night where we get recognized and be able to walk and thank their families and friends. And we saw it this spring and many were left without closure. It was hard to watch my friends and their families to not have I can only speak for, I can only speak for my behalf, but I want to be able to get the most of high school experience as possible. The leadership and team aspect, the growth as a unit, but if there are no sports without my school district, how am I supposed to do that? 
I have waited many years to step up and be a leader for my team and community. We put, we put into practices what we have learned from classes before on the field. Isn't that what you want from us as a student? To be a leader, be driven, and want us to be a part of something bigger. Without sports, many of us will lose our motivation to do anything, and some will turn to other outlets that are not safe to find motivation. I hope you, tr I hope you truly heard us out tonight, as I know other school districts in our community have listened to their community. We are all playing, even some considering allowing spectators, which makes it harder to understand the basis of your decision to punish us and not allow us to play. During our workout now, we have been taking the proper precautions and doing what is asked. Time to wrap this up. All right. What is asked of us so we can play. We are willing to do what it takes to allow us back on the field for more than playing the sport, but for an overall benefit, sports being our lives. Please let us play. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Melkor Cool. And that uh, concludes the uh, community input on this issue. I wanna thank each of the um, ladies and gentlemen that took the time to participate in this event and to express their feelings and their concerns. Um, it's, it's very nice that the community is involved. Um, so we go on to the next agenda item, the, the safe return to play, uh, Dr. Dahl. Good evening, everyone. I too want to thank um, the community. I know a number of people have reached out to um, a number of us in this room this evening. And I do appreciate the feedback from students and parents as always. Um, I was trying to figure out how to uh, begin the presentation with the uh, safe return to play guidance. So I thought I would just take a little bit of time to explain how we uh, came to coming back to school with our phase reopening of school's health and safety plan. And when we approved that, we approved it in June originally, and then we approved it again in July, and then we approved it again in August. And we said all along that it would be a fluid plan. Um, similar to that, I see our athletic health and safety plan as being a fluid plan. And we're taking the recommendations from several different sources to try to make the best or the safest situation for our students. So looking at the phase reopening plan that we had created, the CDC had provided us guidelines. I know a number of the parents um, and some of our students had referred to the CDC guidelines. Some of them referred to the PIAA guidelines. There are a number of guidelines that all of us as school administrators are trying to figure out and how to safely open up and provide safe competition or safe instruction for our students. So for example, the CDC, that information continues to change. So we will continue to monitor that as closely as possible. I pulled it up today. It's still saying two meters, which is about six feet uh, for student separation within classrooms whenever feasible. And uh, the Department of Health and PDE says six feet to the maximum uh, extent feasible. The World Health Organization is telling us one meter, which is about three feet. And uh, the guidance from the Pennsylvania Department of Education, they had reached out to get some information from the Regional Educational Laboratory. And they're telling us between three and six feet. When we're reaching three feet, that's when they start to see the transmission rates uh, decrease. So. As administrators, we are trying to take all that information and trying to make sense of it. The plan that we had received, our health and safety plan says classrooms, learning spaces, occupancy that strives for six feet of separation among students and staff throughout the day to the maximum extent feasible. That means try to get six feet, but if you can't try to maximize it as much as you can. An example of what we've done in our district is removing furniture from classrooms to maximize the space. Are we always gonna reach the six feet of space during instruction? No, but we are trying to maximize that and making it as safe as possible as we are directed by uh, PDE. I think the next step would be to take a minute and have Mr. Graham explain, because I believe we brought the plan to the board to have it approved uh, most recently, but I know that it was developed throughout the summer as well. And I would like him to explain a little bit 
about where that information had come from to develop the plan and any in other information that might be pertinent for uh, the board to understand at this point. Thanks, Dr. Dahl. Can everybody hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, so as Dr. Dahl said, our plan, uh, health and safety plan for a safe return to play began in the summer. In June, we had a uh, fluid preliminary plan approved uh, for a summer voluntary workout. Uh, and then as the uh, summer progressed and things changed, we, we uh, made the adjustments in our plan to, to meet uh, recommendations and guidelines. As far as the plan, the foundation of the plan is built around uh, what Dr. Dahl mentioned, the CDC recommendations and guidelines from the CDC and uh, the PA Department of Health and, and filtering through that information, also guidance from PIAA and collaboration with administrators, athletic trainer, nurses, and, and our district three and league counterparts, our athletic directors, principals, principals and such. Um, so through all that information and with that collaboration, a lot of effort and time was put into tailoring these plans, uh, tailoring this plan to uh, create a plan that, was, that, that made a safe return to play for all student athletes, coaches, and staff. To add, uh, I was also volunteered to be a member of the uh, York Adams uh, competition committee for COVID-19. And through the work of that committee with, and that committee was made up of athletic directors as well. We, uh, through those guidelines, recommendations and, and governor's orders, uh, we created a competition and procedures protocol, which falls right in line with the PIAA's sports specific return to play and their general considerations for a safe return to play. So uh, through all that information, um, th things look very different um, as, as far as what our summer workouts look like. And now we're, we're getting into the phase now where if we begin, we're going to get into the phase of uh, returning to competition, obviously, which takes us out of our static groups and puts us in uh, competition for, with kids in, in, in other areas. And through the planning and the working and the collaboration with everybody involved, uh, we do feel that we, with our plan and with our procedures, competition procedures and protocols, we are meeting uh, the guidance of the CDC and the Department of Health, the PIAA, the National Federation um, for conducting a safe return to play for, for all of our students and, and staff. So to summarize, uh, the foundation of our plan is built on the guidance and recommendations from our state health department and, and our CDC, PIAA, and the National Federation. Thank you, Anthony. Are there any questions from the board related to that? So from there, um, we have taken that information and I know at the last meeting, there were some questions and concerns about a safe return to play. Um, I did create a board proposal for this evening, and um, I'm not going to take and read through this word for word. This is available online. Um, but basically, the challenge that I have as an administrator is looking at some of the mixed signals that are being sent to us um, by the uh, state administration through the Department of Health and the um, Pennsylvania Department of Education where they are recommending a um, stop to sports or not having sports until at least January 1st, 2021. Uh, PIAA did come out on August the 21st and uh, they did approve with a 25 to five vote to resume sports related activities. And they outlined um, you know, some of those parameters. So the issues that, that I had to struggle with as a district uh, superintendent is looking at the mixed messages from the various organizations that are we, we are relying on to make a safe return to play or a safe return to school. We have uh, the Pennsylvania State Department of Health and the Education uh, PDE 
telling us one thing and then we have PIAA telling us something different. So as I look through it, I tried to think about what are some potential options to try to provide a safe uh, return to play uh, for our students. The options we could look at um, would be following what the Wolf administration had outlined and said there would be no scholastic fall sports until January uh, 20th, 21, or January of 2021. Uh, we could just return to play or we could take a look at some of the concerns that maybe some of us um, on the board may have had and look at and see if there's um, something that we can do to revise the current plan that was uh, board approved and see if there are some additional uh, types of requirements that we could look at to add another level of safety before we send our students out to play. And that would be my recommendation. It would be looking at uh, that third option of a conditional return to play, providing an opportunity for a student participation in sports following the uh, board approved athletic health and safety plan, which aligns with the guidance and considerations of both federal and state health entities and additional criteria to enhance student safety while participating in competitions with students from other school communities. And um, this option to return to play is not prohibited, but is not recommended by uh, the current state administration. So what does that mean? If, if you look at the, the table that I had provided, we would want to take a look at uh, the level of uh, community transmission of COVID. And that is currently being tracked uh, throughout the state. If you look at the, uh, the transmission rates, that is something that's coming out, I believe every Thursday, which would provide data for us to just double check and make sure that we're sending students into areas that are safe uh, for them to potentially play. The state is currently looking at low, moderate, and substantial transmission rates. If it's a low rate and we're playing a low rate team uh, transmission rate, uh, that would set up a, um, a green light for us to play. If we're looking at the, the moderate area, which is what most of our local it, it's what we're currently in in Adams County, but also most of our surrounding uh, counties are in a moderate rate. Um, we would just take a, a, a closer look at where we're at currently with the programs of the schools that we're playing. Um, do they have a similar plan that outlines um, similar guidelines that they're following with the recommendations that have come out? Um, we would also have some discussions with individuals from both schools. This typically happens anyway, but it could be um, the principals, athletic directors, athletic trainers, nurses, or other people that are deemed appropriate to have uh, some of that conversation about whether or not it is safe um, for the competition to take place. We would also take a look at, and this is something that Mr. Graham would most likely do, just taking a look at the school's plans that are currently in place and have been board approved. Um, just taking a look at those and making sure that, that we're all following similar guidelines to make sure that we're um, maximizing the safety of our students. So at this point, I'm making a recommendation to the board um, for a return to play and possibly providing a little bit of an update to our current health and safety plan um, for athletics. Thank you, Dr. Dell. <clears throat> Comments from the board. So at the moment we are not necessarily voting to well, we are voting to uh, for sports or uh, or against playing sports or the motion to uh, at the special board meeting right. after this. Yes, correct. But um, we can only vote for one of those choices. Which one is it going to be? The optional recommendation by Dr. Dahl here, or that's that's what the proposal that he is making. Yes. Okay, and I would second that. Um, that that's what makes sense to me. Okay, uh, where we vote for the conditional approval. All right. 
if I could just add a, a couple other pieces to that. I know that um, in the recommendation proposal, and I would imagine that most um, districts will be in a similar situation. If we have a substantial community transmission rate or if we have an outbreak within our district, obviously we would not be sending students to play. Um, we wouldn't wanna jeopardize any of our other which is um, in the proposal. District. Yes, it's in the proposal. Other comments from the board? Dr. Dahl, are, are the other districts, I mean, are they, you know, they're, all the other schools have voted return to play. Are they following pretty much the same guidelines? I mean, I know you're talking with the other superintendents. Anthony, but, do you want to speak to that? You may know more since you attended a recent meeting. Jim, are you talking about uh, the guidelines in the proposal or the conditional return to play? Or are you talking about uh, Department of Health guidelines and uh, CDC and PIAA? Uh, uh, the conditions in the proposal that, that we were just provided with. Um, as far as the conditional return to play um, and looking at what we're going to be looking at as far as moving forward, uh, I in the conversations I've had, no, this is a caveat to our plan for the safety and well-being of our student athletes, staff, and, and community. Um, so I don't know for sure. I haven't talked to everybody, but the people that I've been in circles with, um, I can't say that they have a conditional uh, return to play, such as the one that's proposed tonight. But it's safe to say that the other schools and personnel you've talked to um, are taking the PIAA vote as a green light to play sports for the rest of the season. Yes, as far as um, meeting the state required guidelines and recommendations and orders, yes, I can, I can say that the, all school districts are following uh, those recommendations, guidelines and, and orders. I have one other question. Uh, in the condition, Dr. Dahl, when you're going to use, you're using the uh, incident rate, how come we're looking at the incident rate and not, you know, like our hospitalization rate or our ventilation rate? You know, when, we're, when you're looking at the incident rate, I mean, how accurate of a number is that when we're looking at our teenagers versus, you know, as was stated by one of our speakers, you know, 5,100 5, deaths related from nursing homes. Why, why aren't we looking at actual numbers of our younger people? The, the numbers of transmission, these are the data points that every district, I would imagine, is looking at throughout the state of Pennsylvania. Um, when you're looking at both the transmission and the incident rates, positivity rates, that in turn, it's my understanding that that is how we are determined as a county where we're at. And then the state has outlined what we should be looking at as a possibility if we're in a substantial transmission rate area. The state is providing some guidance on if we're reaching that point, we should possibly be looking at remote learning, which means no one is here at all. If we're in a moderate situation, they're providing us two different opportunities to provide instruction. It could be a hybrid or it could be full remote. So when I'm looking at this, I'm trying for the consistency of how other districts may be looking at this or how other counties are looking at the transmission rates. So the way that the transmission rates are um, shown on both um, the state sites that is consistent throughout the state. So when you look at that, that state map and you click on it and it will show you what we are currently in, if we're in a moderate or if we're in a low uh, transmission rate or substantial, but I think it's a combination of the data that we're looking at. It's safe to say that all the other districts are looking at the numbers the same way. I think we, if you take sports away from this and just look at low, moderate and substantial, that's how I would believe every district is looking at that and how they provide instruction. 
So for example, if our county slips into a substantial transmission rate, which is the red column, at that point, it's our understanding that we will be contacted by PDE to let us know that we are going into that substantial, that red color, which means in turn, we would need to figure out how we are going to respond to that. Are we going to switch to all remote learning or how will we provide instruction? That's the instructional side. Cool. The athletic side is what we're trying to mirror with that. Anyone else? Um, I, I guess this is a question for Mr. Graham, but have coaches, I, I haven't heard anything from coaches or, uh, and I'm, Anthony, I'm assuming that you're, you're, represent, uh, you're the representative of, of all the coaches, but have you heard anything from coaches? Have coaches said they absolutely don't want to participate um, or vice versa? I'm curious to know what they're, feedback is we uh, mr Rutowski, we uh yes i've been in contact with coaches we actually just had our coaches meeting last thursday um with all our fall coaches um i think the coaches understand the situation we're in i think they understand the concern but i i also think they understand where we are with getting pick getting kids back to some normalcy as well so while nobody is adamant about not playing, they understand the concerns, but all of our coaches are uh, able and willing uh, to continue if decided so. Okay. okay. Anything else, James? Um, yeah, I, I do want to express, um, I, I like the um, conditional option. Um, I do want to just point out there, we've received also, we received an overwhelming response here uh, vocally at the board meeting for um, playing to sports. I did receive several calls and emails as well against it. Uh, some of the big concerns that I heard um, were, uh, of course, one of the issues that was not necessarily raised is the community spread. Um, you know, I think the students will be fine. Uh, I, I, I want to be careful how I'd say that, but the studies show that the younger population tends to come out um, okay. Not always, but for the majority, that's the case. Um, but they, there is a risk that they would transmit it to the community. Um, and then there were also concerns about um, you know, we're going to school every, um, or we can't even get into school five days a week. We're in school every other day. Um, you know, we, we can't even do that um, effectively right now uh, with the transmission. So that's a concern as well that was raised. Uh, and then Mr. Wilson, you brought up the comment at, at the last board meeting, just in terms of, you know, you have a group of students that are, um, we, we do all this work to keep them separated and all of a sudden they're tackling each other and up on top of each other. So that's also a concern. So I, I just want to raise that. Um, I will say from my perspective, um, I, I think there are, there's a risk with everything as, uh, um, and this was addressed at last board meeting too. Um, but there's many benefits as well. Um, and, and I think a lot of these benefits were raised earlier um, by, by our community. So I, this decision weighs heavily on me. Um, I don't think either is a, um, there's, it just doesn't seem like a good decision either way, but we have to make a decision, so. Anyone else wish to speak? Could I speak um, now, Tom? Uh, Ron, Ron oh. just put his hand up. I'll get okay, you Okay, then I'll, moment. no, that's fine. That's fair. I just was gonna go off of what James said. Mm -hmm. Ron's working on technology. It'll be a while. <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, I believe I have it unmuted. Anthony, we had uh, had some email exchanges and so forth. The part I was wrestling with is during the day we have masks or face shields for our students. Uh, come 2.30, that's sort of out the window. And basically it spoke to masks in this plan, but not only on the sidelines, not competing, participating. And I can understand that. I wouldn't want to wear a mask running up and down the field. In fact, I wouldn't want to run up and down the field. Uh, but we did talk a little bit, and the one I had the most problem was with football, with the tackling and the pileups and so forth. And in our conversations via email, we came up, and I understand there are face shields available for football helmets. Is that correct? That is correct, Mr. Ebert. And are they affordable, I guess? Uh, yes, they are affordable. And I heard the about $15 a face mask. I believe correct? supply and demand might be in effect, but I believe Well, so. it's the other thing, yes. <laughs> uh, but I was surprised to know then, I said, well, what do we have for hockey and soccer? And the answer was, go ahead. Go ahead, Anthony. Uh, there is nothing for hockey and soccer, correct? Well, as far as I know, there's not. There's been some talk about something. Field hockey wears goggles. There might be something out there uh, I'm investigating that may be able to attach the goggles. But as far as I know right now, I have not heard anything about field hockey. And a traditional face shield has not been declared safe because they haven't done the tests for shattering and so forth, correct? Correct. Not only that, there's uniform requirements and restrictions per the PIAA. Okay, and that, that was one of the things, like I said, hey, we got past football, I think we can live with that, but then I found out nothing for hockey or soccer, uh, which again, by your definition, I understand, are considered contact sports, is that correct? Correct. So that's pretty much what I had to say here. Uh, I would encourage PIAA and parents and everyone to get on some of the powers to be out there to get some face masks or face shields rather that are approved and will make our students safer. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Dr. Fee. Can you hear me all right? I can. Okay. Um, first of all, I did want to say, I wanted to thank Wes and Anthony in particular because uh, pardon my French, but this must have just been a huge pain in the ass. I mean, this is a moving target all the time. And I know you guys are very much invested in it and doing a great job, but I did want to thank you. Um, uh, it, it's it, it, it's got to be frustrating having everything, uh, uh, you know, from different, um, uh, different people saying different things, different agencies and having to deal with all that. And it's a moving target. Uh, and I know that. And I wanna say if the press is still in the room that I said this two weeks ago and I'll say it now, I think there's been a real vacuum of leadership from the top. I think if the governor is gonna say we shouldn't have sports uh, until January, he should have mandated it. Uh, I think um, it was kind of a, a, a weak and cowardly move. And, and, and I think that those of you who, who know me well know that I don't cast aspersions on people, uh, but I think either this is a serious crisis or it's not. And um, uh, I, I, I do want to, I, I have a bit that I want to say now, and, and I ask you to be patient and, and listen to me, but I've, I've really struggled with this uh, in my conscience for the, for the last two weeks, and I've really uh, uh, tried to do uh, a lot of research as well. Uh, we all know that the Upper Adams School Board has received quite a bit of correspondence on this issue. I think James just uh, uh, talked about that, and, and much of it was very passionate, uh, and I know there have been petitions and uh, and that there, there was something like a rally uh, outside of the school uh, tonight. Uh, but as James pointed out, uh, although it would, it would not be accurate to suggest that everyone who contacted us advocated for a return of high school sports, that, that's not true, but it would be fair to say that the large majority uh, certainly took that position and often did so uh, very passionately. Um, as I uh, stated, I believe clearly and unequivocally at our last meeting, I have serious uh, uh, doubts about the wisdom of that course of action, uh, but it's it's my nature and 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 my and my faith to listen closely to those with whom I disagree in order to try to learn from their positions. And 
Uh, in this particular case, uh, everybody who spoke tonight and the letters that we received uh, uh, since last week or two weeks ago, I have to say I agree with almost everything everyone had to say in terms of the benefits of athletics. Uh, I've long been a, 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 a very vocal pro a proponent of uh, high school athletics as anyone who's ever stood anywhere near me on the sidelines of, of a field hockey a game would know. Um, uh, but I, I, I felt that I had the most to learn, however, uh, from two citizens who wrote in support of the return of athletics uh, in their professional capacities as, as medical practitioners. Uh, and so I, I publicly wanna thank Kristen Fulton and, and Rachel Mead for, um, uh, for really making me think about this seriously in terms of science. I, I mean, obviously I heard what they were saying about the value of sports, of course, uh, but they also pointedly reminded me that I have extremely limited knowledge of medicine in general and epidemiology and virology in particular. And I think it's true of, of, of many of us that if we know a lot about one thing, we tend to think that we know a lot about another. And, uh, and I didn't want to fall into that trap. Uh, I, I therefore wanted to ensure that uh, that I didn't become entrenched in a position simply because I believed something to be so, right? Uh, but only because that position was, was thoughtful and was logical and was supported by good evidence. Um, and it seemed to me that in all fairness, uh, I, I should seek resources and advice uh, from uh, three medical and public health uh, professionals that I happen to know very well and whose opinions I trust. Um, these include one of my uh, closest high school friends, a member of my extended family, and a career public health official, uh, um, uh, two of whom I must say were, were, were very uh, successful uh, athletes. Um, one is a frontline medical worker in a very highly affected area in Arizona. Uh, one is a medical school professor in a moderately uh, impacted region. And one has a very intimate knowledge of this particular part of Pennsylvania. Uh, and they also helped me to find some online medical uh, information. Uh, and as always, I'll, I'll make my sources available. But uh, my fundamental question is, uh, is I went to three people and I said, are my concerns about the return of fall sports totally out of line with current research and practice concerning COVID? And am I irrational and unreasonable in my position uh, on this topic? Um, and, and you might be surprised to hear that their responses to these questions they range more of a gamut than you might suppose. Um, and in the end, I think as uh, I think James pointed out, um, they all came back to uh, issues of risk assessment and cost benefit analysis. Um, now my, uh, my friend who's an expert in uh, public health uh, was probably uh, in some ways uh, um, uh, the strongest critic of going back to sports. Um, uh, he summed this up um, uh, uh, very strongly and I'm, I'm gonna quote him here directly, uh, quote, from an infectious disease point of view, there is evidence that the younger folks can have COVID, but not the symptoms, but they can carry it to family members. Uh, and so what he wanted to know is how is important in the sport, is, is the sports season? Is it worth sickness and death? Uh, the young ones get sweaty and, and run into body contact, then bring the COVID protein home on their clothes, sitting in the car, et cetera. Is it really worth it? Um, now, my, uh, my extended family member went further into the nuts and bolts of, of her daily reality, working with victims of COVID. Uh, but as the mother of two young athletes, she was, she was much more nuanced than, than one might suppose in her position on the relationships between kids playing sports and, and their elders dying in hospitals, which is mostly what she works with. Um, uh, her name is Tracy McNamara. She's a doctor in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the Phoenix area. Um, uh, and I'm going to quote her a little bit because she, she really had, I think, a lot of information that's valuable. And as I say, she, she wasn't really one-sided in this. She was like trying to look at um, various sides of the issue. I'm going to quote her here. Uh, having worked now on the front lines as a hospitalist for many months now, at times having 20 plus patients per day, and all of these patients either COVID-19 positive or suspected, you can probably imagine that I have seen very ill people with this virus. Uh, then she goes on to describe um, her gear uh, for protection. I think most of us have, have heard this before and the fact that she has to uh, go into the garage and uh, strip down for the clothes in the washer and, and uh, shower separately and all that. But she makes the point that um, she wanted me to understand the depths of the work she had done on the front lines and the pattern she was seeing. Um, so that uh, I would understand that these were her personal clinical observations and not necessarily that they reflected what uh, is found in clinical literature concerning COVID. 
Um, her point was that she thinks it's vital that we protect anyone and everyone who has medical comorbidities at any age. And it's crucial uh, that we protect anyone over the age of 55 years old, because she said that was the average age she was seeing where she observed otherwise healthy individuals becoming seriously ill with COVID. Um, she also made the point that all the mask wearing and, the, uh, and the, the practice of social distancing was not just to protect ourselves, but much more importantly, to protect others who are vulnerable and who may not understand the implications and complications of the virus to the extent that medical professionals do. Uh, and she pointed out that someone who is my age, 56 and maybe a little overweight, uh, might think, hey, I'm perfectly healthy, I take no medications, and not know that they could indeed become very ill. Um, uh, she also wanted me to emphasize that, uh, granted that there are thousands of people who get no symptoms, mild symptoms, or moderate symptoms, um, and they uh, often aren't admitted, uh, when they go to the ER, they're not admitted into the hospital because they're not ill enough uh, to be treated in an inpatient setting. Um, unfortunately, it's believed that the actual cases far outnumber the recorded cases of COVID-19, with, with some sources suspe uh, suspecting figures maybe uh, 10 times higher than the numbers we're seeing projected on websites such as the Johns Hopkins coronavirus webpage. Um, her point to me, because she was worried about me going back to work uh, and she was worried about uh, Sam uh, going to school. Uh, she said, when going back to school, if you, if you stay masked, truly socially distanced, very diligent about hand hygiene, religious uh, about avoiding touching your face, uh, things are likely to be okay. Uh, but she made the point that um, one must know their health status and be aware that they are in a high risk population, if they are in a high risk population, and take extra measures beyond this when considering going out into the community or working with uh, or visiting someone uh, who's older or immunocompromised or an asthmatic uh, or what have you. Uh, and then when it came to playing high school sports, her point was it all came down to risk and benefit. Um, when it comes to a student playing any high school sport that includes close unmasked proximity to under individuals, uh, other individuals, in her opinion, it's dependent on two factors. One is the health of the family unit and those in close proximity to the student on a daily basis. And if any family members are not in the completely healthy and under 55 years old range, uh, then she would advocate for no group sports. Um, uh, also, if any student is visiting an older family member regularly and very often families are relaxed about masking, uh, she would recommend against turning, returning to sports. Um, she also brought up this point of the 5%, right? You know, how prevalent is the virus uh, within the community? Uh, and she said to me, now this is a hard thing to put a number on, because any percent, uh, even 5%, um, it, it only really takes one student to show up uh, uh, to soccer unmasked uh, and knowingly COVID positive, and the whole team is at risk of contracting it. Um, then they bring it back to their families and you can imagine how it spreads. Uh, she emphasized to me that hypothet hypothetically speaking, 5% or less is the reasonable community benchmark. But it's not very realistic because it only takes one person to change it for everyone. Um, Group sports uh, pose a threat because, of course, people are yelling and, and, uh, and they're breathing heavily and they're close to each other. And the risk of uh, viral aer aerosolization is much higher than being masked while scrolling through a grocery store. Uh, there's no doubt, doubt that if one has the virus, uh, the soccer field could be a perfect arena to transmit it. Um, now, she only provides care for adults, not pediatric patients. But um, her, she emphasized a point that several people have brought up. Um, and that's, it's not that she's so much worried about the completely healthy young getting sick enough to be hospitalized. That's very unlikely. Uh, but her concern is to whom such an athlete will expose himself when that athlete goes home. Uh, finally, I, I, I want to mention uh, an old friend of mine who's on the uh, faculty at the uh, medical school at the University of Toledo. Uh, and he texted me 10 days ago from a ward where he was examining COVID patients at the time. Uh, in his words, quote, Literature shows that asymptomatic kids can, vary, can carry a high viral load and spread infection. They are less at risk for short term with less severe pneumonia, but long term, who knows? And of course, they can spread it to anyone else. Uh, how do you assure social distancing in sports? Six feet remains the CDC recommended distance. Uh, and then he emphasizes, emphasizes, I would not let my kids play sports this fall. This guy was an athlete. His children are athletes. Um, he said, I am at work and literally watching people die from a distance. Last guy was 59, has COVID and pneumonia, intubated and now likely involving heart. He's the third bad COVID case today. And that was the 22nd of August. And our area is relatively spared. Now, 
Unfortunately, in real terms, we have no way of knowing how many young people in our district, on our athletic teams, or on the teams that they play are carriers of COVID. Research indicates that a great many young people who are infected are asymptomatic. And if you doubt the efficacy of the students of this phenomenon, simply look at the local experience of Gettysburg College, which spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to test each student returning to campus twice in the first two weeks of campus and plans to test about a third of the student body another time in the coming week. In the first test, when the students first arrived, six students were found to be positive. Uh, in the second, it was 33. Um, most of these students felt fine, by the way, and almost none manifested any symptoms whatsoever. And I just got an email uh, that uh, we, we've had another set of students uh, who uh, uh, tested positive and are, um, most of them are asymptomatic. My point about that is simply doing a temperature and symptom check before practicing competition will at best only identify that small percentage of young athletes who may be COVID positive and are symptomatic. These are not people who are likely to get severe disease and die. They're likely to be carriers. Um, I'd like to point out that we're a small, relatively insular community, and this has really protected us thus far in combination with the school lockdown and the canceling of spring athletics, which made nobody happy, but kept the disease from spreading. We tend to stay in family units here. I think it's given us a certain measure of protection. Once sports start mixing, our kids actively with those from other communities, the likelihood is that we are going to begin to see increasing cases of COVID. I also want to emphasize that I am speaking against self-interest in this case. I'm a proponent of athletics. I'm a fan of high school sports, and I've had to tell my own son that he can't play, and he's none too pleased with me. I, I risk alienating friends and neighbors. I know I'm doing it right now as I'm speaking, and I have no reason to do so other than the fact that I wish to protect my community. At our Quaker meeting, we try to raise our kids to value all human life as, as absolutely precious, and I'm worried about that one. Uh, my position is that the risk of COVID is very real, that high school sports will increase that risk in this community, and that the chance of a loss of a single life is not worth that risk. I understand that many disagree with this position passionately. And if in six months or a year or, or a year and a half, there are no COVID-related deaths in our community, even with high school sports, I'll be I'll be thrilled to have been wrong, but I won't mind being labeled as alarmist or even hysterical. I just don't feel like anyone is willing to say this. And I feel that the governor has let us down by making me be the bad guy in my community, but I'll do it. Um, if our numbers begin to spike over the next few months, it'll be a pretty good bet that young athletes played a role as vectors for transmission, as that's gonna be a major contact related variable in the context of our community. And I wanna go on the record now so that it's clear that our decision tonight might very well have played a role in that. In sum then, no matter how unpopular it makes me, I cannot in good conscience vote to allow even a relatively small chance of COVID contagion in our community. Even though I personally passionately believe in the benefits of competitive athletics for our youth. This is not a popular position. I believe myself to be in the min minority in the community and quite possibly on the board and I would not be surprised to be voted down. And I'm actually not trying to convince you to agree with, agree with me. Uh, the spirit moves me to speak. I'm, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I feel compelled to speak with conscience. <laughs> At its core, public opinion is not the fundamental issue here. Public health is. I therefore could not be silent and go along with the vocal majority. If I learned anything at all from athletics, it was to stand tall and to do my best, even when I thought I was certain to lose. And I, I know that I've tested your patience, so I'll stop there and, and, and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Fee. Anyone else have a comment? Yes. Thank you, Chris. Uh, I think you covered pretty much all the bases. Uh, I had a mother talk to me and, and basically say that this isn't right. President dumps it on the governor, the governor dumps it on the school board, the school board dumps it on the parents. And I said, hold that thought for a moment. What better person can you think to make a, de a decision for your child? Let's go back and change the verbs a little bit. The president allows the governor to make some choices and come up with some criteria. 
The governor comes up with the various criteria, hands it to the school board. What can you do with it in your community? And then we uh, decide in our buildings and so forth for education, how we are going to structure this. It could be three feet. It could be in some classes, six feet and so forth. The best we can do as a school board, the thing that allows me to sleep at night is that we outline the conditions. We do the best we can to manage through masks, through feet, uh, face shields and so forth, through social distancing, through everything, lunch periods, playground. And then we uh, express that to parents and then they make the decision. They assess the risk, they make the decision for their child. I think that's the fairest way as far as I'm concerned. They can choose to do it or not do it. I think we're going, doing the same thing. We come up with a 50 page document that says this is the safest we can make our sports. I'd feel a lot safer if they had face masks or face shields, especially face shields. I don't think that's gonna happen this year. Parents need to make that decision. Under the conditions we've outlined, can they uh, live with that? Literally live with that, all right? So I, I think that's what we need to do as a board, let the parents make the decision. It's their children that are out there. Yes, there is a danger of spread, but the one thing that kind of was the turning point for me, yes, we can set up the criteria and make it stick, during the school day. At 2.30, that bell rings and those kids are on their own. Whether they go out to the athletic field and play, whether they go to a job, whether they go to a wild party, whatever they decide to do, we have no control over. Now, what do I do? Athletics, we have to own. We're gonna take a vote here this evening as a board member. I have to sort of sign off on that. Am I going to uh, allow the parents to make that decision or am I gonna make it for them? I'm more comfortable in allowing the parents to make their own decision. And that's pretty much where I've come on this decision. Is it perfect? Goodness sakes, no, it's not perfect. Is there risk? Yes. I've assessed the risk. It's as good as we can make it. Let the parents take it from here is what I'm recommending. Thank you, Ron. Uh, if Sue. Um, I'd like to first say, I agree with James, the, the weight of this decision for the last two weeks has been heavy. Uh, I have listened to both sides. I first want to commend the students who spoke tonight. This is a, difficult crowd to address. And I think each one of them did a fine job. They were persuasive and articulate. And I'd like to thank them for that. Uh, part of what I've gone back and forth on, safety, yes. But as Ron said, choice. Choice is pretty important too. And I do think it is the parent's choice to draw the line or allow them to, to play. And so I just wanted to state my agreement with that position. That's Thank it. you. I have some concluding remarks, but I will rather see if the board is done speaking before I do that. So we've been wearing these masks for a good hour and a half so let's give ourselves our 10 minute break here oh, i tried to i tried to give get that earlier but i didn't want to interrupt uh, the people that were speaking we we are a school board for a public school and public schools fundamentally teach students two basic things we teach them curriculum content might be called reading, writing, and arithmetic. And we teach them to become good citizens, good members of the larger community. Some of that teaching is done in the classrooms. 
some on sports fields, in the band rooms, on stages, et cetera, et cetera. We should not minimize the significance of that last statement, but it must be viewed through the lens of our current situation. The school board must provide the administration governance over what the community expects for their schools. This does not mean that we simply parrot what the community says. In fact, over the last two weeks, much of the email, many of the emails that I received did not provide me any helpful input. In the main, the community has said they wanna play sports no matter what, offering various justifications for doing so that seem to center mostly on their children's desire to play sports. The governor recommended sports not be played. The Department of Health recommended sports not be played. The Pennsylvania Department of Education recommended sports not be played. And PIAA recommended sports be played, but then added it's up to the school districts. That means the board must now weigh the various information presented this evening and make a decision, a decision that is in the best interest of the students of the district. That brings me to the proposal presented by Dr. Dahl this evening. His proposal uses state data from the Department of Health and metrics from the Pennsylvania Department of Education. The same data and metrics those agencies provided are used to determine what type of school reopening is used. It also overlays subjective judgment made by people we have come to trust over a significant number of years so that we aren't simply looking at data and making decisions in a vacuum. His plan does, doesn't offer a binary play, no play decision. It offers a week to week evaluation and subsequent decision based on the existing conditions here and at the opponent's home county. In concert with the health and safety plan for athletics, it offers reasonable protection to the players. And finally, it balances the safety needs of the students and staff with the second thing I mentioned at the top, and that is practicing good citizenship and teaching our young people that. So after careful consideration of all of these variables and after many thoughtful hours, subjectively evaluating the risk reward ratio as I see it, I am now in favor of the conditional return to play as described by Dr. Dahl's proposal. And we will get to that proposal or get to the vote on that at our special meeting here in a little bit. So I think each board member has spoken uh, passionately and factually and emotionally on this subject. And I think we've said about all that we can say on this. So I think we should move on. So uh, Mr. Ponce, if you could uh, go to the supplemental contracts, please. Okay, so we're recommending approval for the 2020, 2021 all coaches supplemental contracts effective 8 10 2020 for varsity and 8 17 2020 for all others. As for the list and below, Miles Hughes, assistant junior high football, for the amount of $2,797. This is a, just a standard supplemental contract. Any, any discussion from anyone? Okay, thank you. Uh, Mrs. Jones, the uh, curriculum. Now, now that I can try to find that paper again, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I think there's only one item on the uh, uh, curriculum agenda and that is uh, to review the continuity of equity in education grant. Yes, uh, good evening, Mrs. Jones. Uh, the Department of Education has come out with another round of continuity of education, equity and education grants, the CEEG. 
if you recall back in April, we did not qualify for the one they were uh, handing out then. We did qualify for this one and we were approved and awarded for $37,750. Uh, as standard now with these types of grants, we need a letter of recommendation from the board and also one from the superintendent to send along with the application. So those two letters are attached to the agenda item. Um, we're asking for approval at the next board meeting uh, for those two letters so we can uh, get this uh, grant finalized and uh, get some more much needed financial assistance. Thank you, Mr. Alvin. I think that uh self-explanatory and uh, uh, anybody has further questions on it, they can ask Joe. Okay. Doesn't appear that there are any questions. And I believe that completes the curriculum and extracurricular committee meeting. Yes. So we'll move on to the business and operations. Um, Mr. Lady. property. Um, I was on mute myself, sorry. Oh. I declare a surplus of the following items from the Biggerville High School. You don't uh, need to read those unless you speak German. I was hoping you were going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to try though. <laughs> and I recommend for approval. And also uh, recommend for approval for uh, Orangeville Borough Bill 6 for the Orangeville Elementary Expansion Project as per the attached documents. Um, we no longer teach German, is that correct? Correct. So the, the German textbooks are not of any use. Um, on these uh, invoices for the borough, is any, do you have any comments on that? Is this straightforward? It appeared straightforward. Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. Okay. Any questions from anyone? Okay, thanks, Jim. Um, transportation, there's nothing there tonight. So we'll go to uh, finance. Mrs. Krause. Okay. Um, first item are uh, to accept the following donations and grants. One is a Walmart, Walmart grant in the amount of $1,000 for Upper Adams Intermediate School for school supplies. Um, item two from the Biglerville American Legion would be 50 flags for the classrooms at UAIS, as well as an American flag for the new flagpole there, and one Pennsylvania flag to also fly at UAIS. Okay, any questions or comments? I think it's very, uh, very heartwarming that the community steps forward as we move to open our new school wing and and donates these items that uh, we well we might not have thought about them in time okay okay uh, the next item is uh, the radio system maintenance contract between upper adams school district and knc communications effective january 1 2020 to december 30 2025 at the annual cost of four thousand one hundred seventy dollars This is a, just a standard update to the contract that we've had with them, correct? Uh, that's correct. It was never finalized in January, so we're catching up and cleaning that up. Okay. okay. Any other qu questions? No? Okay. The next item is uh, a COVID-19 financial update that Dr. Dahl and Mrs. Hobbs have started for us. Uh, thank you. What you have before you tonight is just an update on some of the financial impact that we've had with COVID and some of the money that we talked about through the budget process for 2020 to uh, 2021. At the top of the sheet, we talked about when we were doing budget, the CARES funding, and we had that factored into our budget of the $211,816. And you can see that we used 209,000 for the iPads for the kindergarten through third grade, the portion that we have to um, allocate to the non-pubs. So we do have a zero balance in that CARES funding. And that all had to be spent um, no later by October 30th of this year. 
So that has been taken care of. So that grant will be closed out here at the end of September when we can finally do the, the final report and the quarterly report for that. To this, at this point, we have received about 23,000. So once we submit that final paperwork, we will get the remaining balance. If we look at the PCCD COVID funds, during the budget period, we were talking and it was allocated to us that we would be receiving $238,201. When the grant was released um, back in August, the allocation at that point is at $186,494,000. So we are short at this time about $50,000 and we are not the only school district that was shorted money. They're trying to figure out where the other pot of money is coming from across the state. So that is still left in limbo. As we walk down through that sheet, um, we have spent about $75,000 in COVID supplies. So that would be supplies that we have purchased for transportation, for in the classrooms, face shields, masks, those sort of things. We have also purchased and have slots for ingenuity for our elementary students and our secondary students. And I, this part of the, the chart is very fluid at this point. Um, we will have some more solid numbers for you after the 14 day grace period. Uh, students have 14 days that they can decide if they wanna stay in ingenuity or if they do not. And Mr. Alvin has been working very hard and communicating with those students. We've been having students coming back to the district after they realize that this may not be the right program for them. So these numbers were as of last week of 827. So at this point, you can see that we have overspent um, the COVID PCCD money of about almost $14,000. And the ingenuity is only representing semester one, which will um, end January 15th, 2021. And then Mr. Alvin just mentioned about this, the continuity of education equity grant, the $37,750. Um, we're going to use about $23,000 for the iPad charging carts. And then we do have some money set aside to help cover that negative balance I just mentioned about. Um, for ingenuity, so that will help balance out that negative that we currently have. Any questions on what we're currently seeing and what we've spent? <laughs> <laughs> no, not, not for me, although I'm not wild about red numbers. Anyone else? I did have a question in terms of ingenuity. If we have students with special needs, is there a different rate for ingenuity or is it that 1100 per semester as a constant? Yeah, at this time, we have not seen a, a different rate. And actually, ingenuity does give us a consultant, uh, basically, a special ed teacher on their staff that works with a case manager that we have here in the district, which is a which is a special ed teacher here. And then in collaboration, there's discussion back and forth and we make sure everyone's on the same page with any accommodations or modifications that are needed for, for that child. Okay, thank you. If, if I could interrupt you for just a minute, it's time to put the mask back on. And I would just like to point out one additional comment. Um, on the bottom left of the chart, I did include the 19, or I'm sorry, the 2020-2021 cyber charter rates. Um, that would be what we'd be paying for our students if they would be attending an outside cyber program for um, regular education or special education. And for those enrollment numbers, we will probably not have a solid number of enrollees until maybe October or November because enrollment has been high for those cyber programs and we're hearing from the buildings as well that um, they are really far behind and if students are leaving our school to attend one of those programs that the enrollment is probably at least 30 days out so at this time those students are currently enrolled so we may see some 
um, effect later on going into October, November timeframe. So at this point, we do not have a solid number on any of those students going to the cyber or charter schools. Okay, thanks. I will share that the students that have left Edgenuity, all but one of those uh, have come back to us to the building. So we've only had one that actually chose another outside cyber over coming to the back to the building or, or ours. So um, it's been, so far it's been a, a positive. I just wanna make a statement to thank Joe publicly. I know it's been a lot of work setting it up and um, you know helping parents and students to get up and running. Um, as, as Mrs. Hobbs had mentioned, we will have closer numbers and, and uh, more accurate numbers, hopefully at, by our next um, meeting in um, October. Um, at this point we have, and I know this keeps changing, I, as of uh, the 31st of uh, August, we had 139 students um, within the district that were using Edgenuity. And um, when you look at the total cost of all that, it's about $170,000. If those individuals would have chosen an outside cyber school, um, you can pretty much figure up the, the cost of that by taking 139,000 and multiplying it times what Mrs. Hobbs had shared down below, just a non-special ed rate would be about $1.7 million. Um, if all those students were special ed, 139 students, that would have been $3.5 million. So anywhere in between there is um, an estimated cost of what it would have cost if we didn't have a program at Upper Adams School District for our cyber option. Okay, the next item is the timeline for the 2021-22 budget. This timeline is very similar to past timelines. Um, the only thing I would may consider moving is um, our auditors will be here the week of September 14th. And I have an annual report that is due to PDE by the end of October. So where I have here for January 5th, 2021 for a presentation of the 20 or for the 1920 status update and the, giving you the final numbers for that, I would like, um, I'm looking at proposing and moving that up to November so we can fully close out uh, the 1920 school year and fully be on board then for the 21-22 and um, because we will also have a good history as well for this year of the 2021 budget. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me. The next item is a banking service proposal from ACNB for the Upper Adams School District as per the attached proposal. Um, attached is the proposal and then there's also an attachment with estimate of fees. Um, currently we are with PNC Bank and they used to be located here in Bicklerville and now they are, our only location is in Gettysburg. So we are traveling to make our deposits and we are losing some personnel time and it is a liability as well for that individual to go. So I did reach out to ACMB. We have local branches here in Bicklerville, Bendersville and Arntsville to see what they could provide for the district as well. So when you look at the estimate of fees, what I did was I compiled all the information from PNC for the last 12 months and gave them some of our history of how many checks have cleared, how many checks we write, how many um, direct deposits we do, all that good stuff to give us um, an estimate. Um, so it's sort of comparable. And the um, one thing, if you're looking at the fees that we currently do that I would like to be switching is we do some wires and I think we can control that those fees, which total about $840. And we can look at switching those from a wire to an ACH, which will lessen those fees. 
direct deposits we do need for our payroll, electronic reporting is so we could have access to everything online. And one difference that we would have from PNC to ACMB would be the fraud protection. And that is an additional charge that is listed on the fees. And that fraud protection actually protects the district. So whenever we, we would write a check, we actually send a file to ACMB. And when that check would clear, it would also match. So if the check is not matching the file that we send them, it would kick out and we'd have to clear that as an exception. So it would help protect the district that no one could um, try and alter our checks. Um, in the proposal as well, the interest rate that they're looking at giving us, there was two different options. There was an option one and an option two. One was a 0 0.30 and one was a 0 0.25. The 0 0.30 would, um, we would be paying for the fees, which are sort of, sort of outlined above. And the 0.25, we would not pay the fees. In looking at this and talking with um, ACMB earlier today, I'm in favor of recommending option one for the higher interest rate. Um, in my monthly treasurer's report that is um, attached to this second board meeting that you approve every month, <laughs> We have funds at PISLAP and our current interest rates there are at a 0 0.03 compared to a 0 0.30. So we could be earning more money as well with ACMB. So I'd be looking to see if we can transfer funds from PISLAP to also ACMB to um, have a higher interest, which would help offset the fees as well. Shelley. Yes. The uh, fraud protection would only be on checks to vendors, correct? That is correct. Not our direct deposit and so forth. That's correct. And by having a local bank, we could be making those deposits more frequently. So the um, interest would also be more cumulative on a daily average. And we would still keep, we would still maintain one account with PNC and that would be our district credit card that we'd also do earn rebates on as well. I'm in favor of using a local bank. Um, just a quick question though. I'm, I'm just curious, are there other districts that are using uh, Adams County National yes. Bank? Anything else? Okay, item uh, 4F, I guess I can do F and G together. Um, it's the 2020-2021 IDEA section 619 pass-through funds agreement between Upper Adams School District and the Lincoln Intermediate Unit 12 for the project period of July 1, 2020 to June 30, 2021. And item G is the pass-through IDEAB pass-through funds allocation agreement between Upper Adams School District and Lincoln Intermediate Unit 12. This is just a yearly formality as well as we receive funds from the IU um, that help offset our services that we um, receive from them. Okay, um, item 4H is a request for a substitute personal care assistant to work with a kindergarten student for safety and behavioral documentation at Bigglerville Elementary School for September 8, 2020 to October 30, 2020. Yes, we do have um, a kindergarten student who has some uh, pretty specific behaviors that are pretty dangerous. Um, one is elopement. Um, we had several adults have to chase this student. Um, also, there's some other behaviors that we um, have some concerns about. Uh, what we'd like to do is have a personal care assistant with this student to October 31st. Um, uh, using that person to help, number one, keep everybody safe, and two, to start collecting data and do a functional behavioral assessment so that we can start providing some interventions with a student 
and hopefully um, curb some of these behaviors so that we don't have to go into um, any type of alternative placement for this student. At, at this late date, where do we find such a person and how do we fund it? It's a great question. Um, what we would utilize right now is ESS. We do have some people on the substitute list. Um, funding for the student would come out of our other, um, other professional services. Um, and at this point, I'm hoping that the money used now will save money down the road so that we don't, we don't have to look at the student going into a placement of some sort. Yeah, I understand that completely. And, and, and I support this. I just, uh, having just had a uh, briefing from the business administrator about financial updates for COVID-19, just wanna make sure we're not, we're doing the right thing here, I agree, but we, we, have, we also have to be able to pay for it. Okay. Okay, um, final item, our supplemental contracts for 2020-2021, um, Rebecca Kiefer as a color guard instructor. Standard stuff. Okay, any questions, comments from the board for the finance? All right. Um, Mrs. Janzik couldn't be here this evening, um, so I asked Dr. Fee if he would uh, step in and uh, take that for us. Sure, Mr. President, uh, and I will not uh, belabor you with my uh, Cindy Janzik impression, although it's really good. Um, <laughs> but uh, first of all, under A, we have other contracted services, uh, adding the following individuals to the volunteer listing. Um, and that uh, uh, those would be items one through five, uh, Ellen Vranich, Eric Vranich, uh, Scott Stanko, um, Donna Gano, and Joyce Coulter. And um, those are retroactive into August. Okay. I don't oh, see anybody. I didn't know if, didn't know if Shelley had a thing to see. Um, doesn't seem to be any questions. Okay. Um, then uh, to add the uh, following individuals to the ESS Northeast uh, Teacher and Sports Staff uh, substitute listing. Uh, under uh, number one, we have items A through C, that's Julie Nagel, Lori Nelson, and Nancy Grove. And item two, um, we have um, items, uh, it's ESS support staff substitute listing which would be A through, is that F? I can't see all the way G, down my screen. G. No, it's the G. Cynthia. Uh, I, had to, I, had to, I had to roll it down. Yeah, uh, Diane Myers, uh, Marietta McDonald Heckman, uh, Deborah Gebhardt, uh, Donna Graybill, uh, Yannick Greer, uh, Jill Hoko, oh, Jill, and uh, Cynthia Snavely. Um, and that's what I've got for that. Nobody, and, nobody seems to have any questions here. I'm just moving on until you stop me, Tom. Okay, um, that's fine. Uh, so the other contracted services, uh, the next item is uh, ESS support services, uh, uh, permanent staff listing. Uh, and that's uh, one person, Diane uh, Seychelle, Seychelle um, English language instructional assistant uh, at the UAMS VHS, uh, effective retroactive to the 26th of, um, of August. Um, then under the next category, which is D, I've got other contracted services, Aramark uh, employee listing. Um, and we have two people to add there, um, uh, both uh, custodial staff. Uh, Edward McKinnon would be at the middle school and high school retroactive to the 19th of last month. Uh, Catherine Collins uh, will be at all locations retroactive to the 26th. Um, and then we have no items under the, uh, the next one, but we do under uh, classified employee handbook. Oh no, it just says there have been no changes since the last approval, right? Which was on my birthday, October 15th, anti-tax day uh, of last year. Thank you for the color commentary. 
Well, it's as far as you can get from April 15th and still be in the same year. So I, I get it. I, <laughs> I did didn't you? miss it. I, I thought maybe you needed it. that explained. No. no, I got that. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and uh, then we do, oh, I'm not number six, am I? No. That's uh, not no, me. you. Um, any questions or comments on personnel? Okay. Thanks, Chris. Um, the last item is the election information, Mrs. Hobbs. Yes, this is an annual process of the PSBA candidates. And we have attached the candidates information. And with that, I believe there's one president, there's two vice presidents, so you will need to pick uh, a vice president and all the other ones, I believe there's only one candidate. So we will need to vote on those at the next meeting as well. So we all need to show up the next time deciding whether we wanna vote for candidate A or candidate B in the, at the, the president level? A uh, vice president. A uh, vice president level. Okay. All right, we'll have to handle that then. Any questions about the PSBA election? Okay, I think that completes our agenda for the uh, business and operations meeting. Uh, before we go to the special board meeting, I just wanna remind the policy committee meeting will be the day after tomorrow at 9 a.m., I assume in the boardroom, in the boardroom. All right. Uh, we'll now go on to our special board meeting, and uh, unless I hear objections, I will truncate the uh, agenda. Uh, but um, let, right now, I call to order the special board meeting. Could you please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance and a, and a moment of silence? I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the republic which is it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I have a roll call, please. Here. We can't hear. hear. Mr. Fee? Here. Mrs. Janzik? She is excused. Mrs. Jones? Mr. Lady? Here. Mr. Ponce? Here. Mr. Ratoski? Here. Mr. Wilson? Here. Thank you. Um, unless there's objections from the board, I would like to move down the agenda to the only item and that's under athletics. Hearing and seeing no objections. Um, Mr. Ponce, could you take over the meeting at the athletics, please? Okay, so the recommended approval of the safe return to play guidance utilizing the conditional return to play option as per the attached safe return to play guidance board proposal presented by Wesley T. Dahl, superintendent. Second. <clears throat> Motion before the board to recommend approval of the safe return to play guidance uh, presented by the superintendent and discussed earlier tonight and it has been seconded. Is there any further discussion? Hearing none, I'd like to have a roll call vote, please. Mr. Everett? Yes. Mrs. Jones? Yes. Mr. Lady? Aye. Mrs. Krause? Yes. Mr. Fee? Nay. Mr. Ponce? Yes. Mr. Ratoski? Yes. Mr. Wilson? Aye. Thank you.
The uh, motion carries. Uh, there is no other business on the agenda. Uh, do I hear a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. We have a motion that's been seconded to adjourn the meeting. Thank you very much for your attention this evening. I also want to say once again uh, to the public, thank you for your interest in this issue. And I would also like to express my appreciation to the board for a rich and uh, extensive discussion of a very important topic. Thank you. Good night.